Dear colleagues, good afternoon. Today, the topic of our session is an open banking. Uh, this uh, topic is uh, in line with all the discussions that we have uh, had at the platform of Phenopolis. A lot has been said about competition at other sessions. First of all, they were talking about the changes in the world and the changes in clients' expectations. And we have to uh, come up with um, those changes. And a lot has been said about the tools and the platforms that will allow us to change the competition landscape and to create new opportunities uh, for clients a new experience for customers and our session will focus not on API as a technical uh, tool because um, it is primarily a technical instrument to solve specific problems, but uh, we will focus on the general philosophy of open banking of this phenomenon uh, in the modern reality. The banks are forced to change uh, their approaches and business models in order to have uh, more flexible approaches. And experts think that in the first uh, half of uh, 2018, the overall investment amounted to almost uh, 58 billion uh, US dollars, and that is a great amount than that we have last year and we have a certain competitive environment and we have the expectations for the changes that uh, our clients and customers have and on the other hand we have uh, uh, some pressure exerted by the regulator, especially in Europe, and that prompts the bank to be more open and to create a new solutions. And there are also certain requirements uh, for the security, for the protection of the data. And uh, today, uh, we would like to discuss the following topics with our speakers. Uh, how is uh, this process developing in some countries that um, have uh, made some progress already? And uh, our participants will share with us their experience, will talk about whether it is possible to find and to preserve a certain balance in being open and in protecting data. Also, we will be talking about the expectations of millennials and uh, their influence they it has on uh, the overall changes and at all the sessions we've been talking about the role of regulator and the role of other uh, participants of the market. So today we will talk about all these topics with the participants of our session. Today we have with us Mr. Gavin Littlejohn, Chairman of Financial Data and Technology Association. Uh, he has been um, one of the key initiators of establishing the group consisting of uh, nine uh, major banks and now he's providing cons consultations to different um, boards and authorities in the U.S. and Canada about creating new standards. Uh, Mr. Chris Michael, Chief Technology Officer for Open Banking Limited, he is responsible for the implementation of the guidelines of PSD2 on the basis of um, the standards together with uh, the leading banks of Great Britain. Mr. Nikolai Varma, Independent Financial Services Advisor, he has had an extensive experience of working with banks in Russia and Europe. Ms. Olga Dergunova, Deputy President and Chairman of the Management Board of VTB Bank, one of the major ones in um, Russia, and she is responsible for the uh, transformation in the group. Ms. Victoria Richardson, Chief Strategy Officer representing Australian Payments uh, Network, and uh, she has had a um, uh, very extensive um, 
experience in this uh, sect, uh, Mr. Alek Proto Andrei Protopopov. Uh, he is deputy director for IT and product development of Kiwi, and Mr. Alek Shkinov, vice president of ITG Holding. Uh, we have a um, very diverse panel today in terms of uh, participants, and I think we will have a very uh, fruitful, multifaceted discussion. Uh, a little bit about the uh, regulation, the time regulation of our session. First of all, our speakers will uh, talk about their viewpoints, about their expressions, and then we will have a Q&A session and we will try to respond to all the questions you may have. Uh, the first question is to Mr. Little John. On European territory, starting from this year, new guidelines of PSD2 uh, came into force and the banks should open an access to uh, clients' information and um, the uh, payments should uh, be made by intermediaries. That should be allowed. And following uh, Europe, other countries, India, Singapore, uh, the US and Australia have put forward similar initiatives and we expect that half of the G20 countries will move toward creating uh, new uh, open banking standards. So how can you characterize this international trend in open banking movement? Can we expect that uh, it will be um, done um, in accordance with the uh, PSD to guidelines or the markets will develop new approaches and uh, what novelties can we expect to see in uh, different countries and it will be very interesting to uh, hear your viewpoint about the role of a regulator and other market uh, participants. Uh, we hear that there are certain requirements for API for opening op API and there are markets that are uh, more open and more transparent in some markets. They are specifying uh, these requirements themselves. And how can we uh, preserve this balance uh, between the regulation and the opportunities to choose the methods and technologies? Thank you for having me. It's a, a very uh, complicated picture that's emerging. The situation is that um, countries uh, in lots of uh, different areas of the world have been exploring the opportunity in open banking. Uh, but uh, first, uh, let me provide a definition. Open banking is the process whereby a customer can choose to share their financial information with a third party to their betterment. And in order for this to take place, there are a number of things that we need to put in place to look after the customer's interests. The first thing, um, and without which we cannot really move forward to the second, is that every country that wants to develop an open banking agenda first must make clear that it's the customer's data and that the data does not belong to the institution. The customer has the opportunity to better their financial position by providing their data to a third party who can um, run the uh, the opportunity for that customer through their algorithm and work out better solutions that better meet the customer's need. The second part uh, in the open banking journey is to be assured that the customer has to provide explicit consent when their data is shared with another party. The third and by far the most important is that you set up an adequate liability model that looks after the customer's interests if something goes wrong. Let us not forget that whereas in a normal banking relationship, there's a direct relationship between the customer and the institution, in an open banking relationship, we still have the institution and we still have the customer, but there could be dozens of companies in the middle that are hosting the same data. So we need to make sure that we're able to make the customer whole if something goes wrong. And then we have to set up the legal and regulatory framework that support the, the customer's rights in their data, their consent in using it, and the liability framework that we've just discussed. In Europe, the critical step was that we transferred the liability model 
from being a contingent liability on the balance sheet of the bank for data loss through to being a contingent liability on the balance sheet of the insurance sector. So now every fintech that wishes to play in open banking in Europe has to become a regulated actor and they have to be able to prove as part of their application to their regulator to get into the market that they have adequate cyber risks insurance to look after the customer. And it's only then when you've got those first four points that you should turn your attention to technology because you need to build open banking with a proper assessment of the market requirements that you're building for. Certainly in the UK, there were a number of things that we went through delivering open banking, uh, which uh, we would have done differently with hindsight had we had better appraisal of things like how the liability model was going to land and, and how we deal with things like traceability. So um, we've started to see um, you know, in addition to the technical build-out, which a number of countries have jumped into uh, before they've sorted out the previous elements that are requirements of open banking, we're starting to see now a lot of uh, uh, collaboration in the international community between these different jurisdictions and between the regulators trying to share best practice and the learnings they were able to take forward. The one thing that's crystal clear is that there's significant customer demand for this. Um, in the UK alone, um, under PSD2, we reckon that there's about 7,500 new customers signing up to it every day. And um, they're starting to get the opportunity to be have uh, better access to affordability and credit, better portability of their identity, better fraud prevention measures. And it's not just the fintechs, the banks are all deploying their own fintech propositions now. So um, everybody's starting to learn to galvanize the data to make better use of it for the customer's betterment. And for me, that's an important uh, focus point for everybody that engages in this. There has to be laser focus on good customer outcomes by getting to know the customer better. That's the whole point of open banking. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Gavin. Thank you very much. I'd like to clarify one question, which will be interesting for the audience. You've mentioned that the development of the concept uh, of open banking, bank as a service, uh, it is driven by uh, the customer's um, demand because the customers, they need that. But on the other hand, there are some other reasons why open banking emerges and why we have uh, API standards being implemented. And uh, getting back to the role of regulator, is it sufficient to develop this uh, direction, um, have only the requests, the demand on the part of the client, or we need more systemic uh, requests and uh, uh, certain um, requirements and the part of the regulator. What are the drivers of this uh, um, path of the development in uh, different countries? So one of the things that we learned when we were transitioning from the regulatory element, and just to be clear, nowhere in the Europe-wide PSD2 does it mention the three-letter acronym API. It just doesn't, it's not in the regulation. We uh, looked at the situation of what had to happen under the regulations and worked collaboratively between the fintech community and the banking community with the regulators always in the room making sure that everybody focused on good customer outcomes and negotiated a move towards what became known as the open banking standard um, in 2000 that was negotiated through 2015. The point is that when we started to bring this live in the market in 2018, uh, when, when the nine largest banks in the UK brought their API up as a standard, we discovered um, little imperfections. And the easiest way for everybody that isn't completely clear uh, to understand what, a, you know, what an API is, well, the front end of the API is called the security profile. That's where, let's make it easy, 
the fintech and the bank connect to each other. And the easiest way to think of that is a little bit like an electricity plug. So the banks built the plug socket and the fintechs all came along with the plug. And we discovered that not all of the plug sockets were exactly the same shape. And it took roughly two and a half weeks per fintech to connect to each bank. And that was, you know, only, um, you know, eight, eight banks at the time had gone live. And it was quite complicated. And it wasn't, and uh, no doubt my colleague uh, Chris will build on this a, a little bit, but the, um, it wasn't until we started to introduce some capability, some implement, real implementation capability to coordinate and enforce standards that we were able to tidy up the delivery. And I would encourage anybody that has the vested interests of avoiding complexity and risk to really focus as an ecosystem on collaboratively building the standards because it's just uh, too difficult if you end up having every bank build their own API and every fintech try and connect to it. It increases the engineering costs for everybody. It increases the requirement for penetration tests, for security audit. It increases the difficulty for the regulator in knowing what good looks like. And at the end of it all, it makes it extremely difficult for the cyber risk insurance market to price risk. So I would just encourage everybody to focus on standards, strict conformance to those standards, and make sure that when, when the time is right to move to the next standard, that the market's ready for it and can move. Uh, the, yeah, it just was far too expensive and complicated to do it any other way. So we understand that the role of regulator is that to protect a customer and uh, to create favorable conditions uh, for client's experience. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gavin, for the general um, viewpoint and overview of international experience. And now let's talk about the practice of implementation of uh, uh, open banking phenomenon and concept as it has been mentioned in the beginning of this year the open api has become the requirement for nine banks in the uk um, in conformance with psd2 and chris is um, the one responsible for the implementation of those api and chris i have uh, uh, the following question to you, uh, not about the practice itself, first of all. It's, um, Great Britain, the uh, UK, is quite specific in um, this uh, direction, so uh, you've uh, specified your requirements on the basis of PSD2, but also on national requirements of the regulator in terms of the competition and uh, a uh, high number of um, organizations and institutions that are taking part in that. Uh, your company has uh, your company was established in uh, 2016 and you've done a great job cooperating and negotiating with those nine banks and since January the world has changed for all the market participants and the UK and uh, which results have you obtained and what is the attitude of market participants towards what is happening uh, maybe customers experience has changed um, let's hear what you think about that and we've touched um, the following topic, uh, open banking and open API, is not only about technologies. We've talked about creating new customers' experience. So how do you build this interaction with customers, with clients? How do you understand creating this customer's value that uh, has to be the result of opening uh, data API? Yeah, so thank, thank you. Um, Effectively, what, what we've uh, been mandated to do as, as an entity in the UK is to create a set of standards for open banking, which are in line with PSD2. Um, our original remit was something called the CMA order, the Competition and Markets Authority order, which is a kind of a subset or a precursor to PSD2. So what we have done is developed a standard that the nine largest retail uh, banks in the UK were mandated to go live with ahead, about a year and a half ahead of the requirement for the rest of Europe. Um, 
And as, as, as my colleague Gavin mentioned, um, you know, we have had a number of issues in the ecosystem. So what we've been doing as we've been going live is kind of ironing out those, those issues. Um, and this is, if you like, a beta test for, for the rest of, of Europe and for that matter for any, any market who's looking at open banking. You know, I would urge everyone to look at what's, what's been going on in the UK, both, both good and bad. But um, we, we ultimately, we have developed what I believe is a very, very good standard for open banking APIs. And the reason I think it's a very good standard is because we've developed this in a collaboration model with um, a large number of participants. We've had over a thousand people from the industry contributing to these standards. They are truly open standard. We've had people from banks, fintechs, third party vendors, all contributing to this standard over the last pretty much two years. We published our first version of the standard back in uh, August uh, last year. Six months later in January, that went live with eight of the nine banks, or rather it started to go live with eight of the nine banks. At pretty much the same time, we published version two of the standard. So there's a kind of six month lag between when we publish a standard and when it's going live. Um, what we've seen during the, 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 the kind of first half or two thirds of this year is uh, a number of these issues from when the banks went live with version one. And we've been working very hard to kind of iron out those issues. What we've seen now is that um, version two of the standard has just gone live with uh, the nine banks now last month. Simultaneously last month, we published version three. Version three of the standard that we published is not a UK standard. It is a, actually it's a global standard for open banking APIs. And I stress again, it is open. The, the, the key point of this is that it's there to do a number of things. It's there to enable banks to meet their regulatory requirement under PSD2 and the subset, which is the CMA order. But it's also there to enable innovation. And it's, there are a number of elements of the standard which are not mandatory requirements, but which are market needs. So those examples are... Um, things like additional fields of data in a transaction uh, uh, response. So uh, third parties can request additional data, obviously with the customer's consent. Um, and if the bank is able to provide additional data, they can do so over and above what they have to provide for regulatory reasons. And we felt this is important to enable innovation, to not limit the scope of the APIs to, um, uh, to just the strict regulatory requirement. And that's also important because we want this to be a standard which gets wider adoption globally. But one of the key things that we've been focusing on over the last year is building out a conformance tool set and a certification process. So these conformance tools are open source software that banks and third parties can use to download and test that their implementation does meet the requirement. And then what we build on top of that is a certification process so we can certify that a particular implementation does meet the standards and that's useful for the market. It, it proves to the market that a bank has done the right thing. It's useful to regulators and it's also useful to, to, to the banks. So that conformance and certification process is something that's been going for a, a while now and we've been extending that out. Um, we expect version three though of the standard that we just published to go live between March and September next year and that's where we're expecting a real step change. Because what's, um, what, what we've seen to date is um, a number of issues around user experience, um, around performance. And this certification process isn't just technical. We'll look at performance, availability. We'll look at the user experience, all of these other elements. And what we're expecting is a real step change. It's really too early to see significant customer adoption yet. And the real benefit will be delivered by the third parties, the fintechs. Bearing in mind the point that Gavin made that any bank has also got the right and can, and many of them are, becoming fintechs or providing a fintech proposition as well. So what we're starting to see is the standards, I believe, a really good standard now. The implementation is getting better because we are providing this conformance to certification process. We're expecting a step change from March next year around performance, usability, functionality, and that's when we think we're really going to start to see an acceleration in the number of propositions that third parties, that fintechs bring to the market and also the customer adoption. And the thing that I'm really excited about is we're seeing a real mix of third parties, very small 
fintechs with amazing propositions, which are, you know, could be real game-changing. Particularly, this isn't just about account information, it's also about payment initiation as well. There's some really exciting fintechs coming up with really innovative payment methods based on open banking APIs. I think this is going to be really transformational. But we're also seeing some of the very big tech giants, the Apples, the Googles, the Facebooks, Amazons, these guys coming into the, or not yet coming into the market, but uh, declaring their interest to come in and consume and partner with banks to offer uh, additional value. And I think that combination of small fintechs and big fintechs or big tech companies is going to really uh, drive innovation in this space and drive real customer value. Thanks a lot. Well, a lot of work has been done, uh, both technological and organizational, and fintechs, as of now, since January this year, fintechs of, in the UK, have they felt any serious changes? Uh, are there new possibilities to create new products? If yes, then what interesting products uh, have appeared or will appear in the near future in the market? And uh, how do you interact with fintech companies? Well, if the bank uh, with the customer's uh, consent provides data to fintech, how the bank can be sure that the fintech that provides an interesting uh, service to the client? So on the fintech side. So yeah, we're, um, we're seeing some, some really interesting propositions coming to market. I mean, the, the, the kind of obvious use case is uh, where open banking APIs replace screen scraping and they provide a better, more reliable, more secure alternative uh, to, to customers in examples like uh, aggregation of accounts, analytics that sits on top of multiple accounts, accounting packages, these sorts of examples. But I, I don't think that is particularly exciting. It's just a better version of what, what we've got to, uh, you know, uh, at the moment through screen scraping. Um, I think the real, in, the real innovation is when you see um, products that combine account information with payments that can um, help customers move money between accounts more seamlessly um, and I think the really exciting potential is for open banking APIs so APIs that it's combined with real-time payments has, has got the potential to replace card schemes, direct debits, all of these um, uh, methods that are out there in the market at the moment that are widely used that have got some, you know, have got benefits, obviously, but have also got inherent issues with fraud and risk and lack of transparency. So I think that on the payment side, there is a really exciting potential for open banking APIs to offer a much better user experience, much more transparency, um, and much much lower cost and much better security. I think there's also um, we're starting to see companies come into the market that are doing brilliant jobs with rapid affordability in lending frictionless onboarding of new customers for the banks and the fintech role being able to see where their customers are when they're not with them we're able to calculate and reverse engineer the apr on savings products and credit products um, there's a number of interesting propositions that are helping uh, customers to accumulate savings into long-term investments more rapidly um, we're starting to see uh, a lot of collaboration around fraud reduction. Um, so both for the banks and for the fintechs, this is an amazing opportunity to get better customer outcomes and, uh, and to innovate. Chris, a more difficult question to you, since we've been talking already about the driver towards open banking in the UK was uh, the regulator's uh, requirement to develop com competition. On the other hand, your organization is financed by the nine major banks who uh, act under the PSD2. Is there any conflict of interest here? And how is the competition developing? How does this instrument allow you to introduce changes? Yes. Yeah, so I mean, we, we are, although we are funded by the, the, the nine largest banks, we are completely independent, and our governance in the UK comes under the Competition and Markets Authority, the Financial Conduct Authority, and the Treasury. Um, and our, our steering committee is um, chaired by an independent trustee, 
And although the banks sit on that steering committee, we also have representatives uh, from uh, fintechs, other third parties, pay other payment service providers, challenger banks, um, consumer panel, and small business representatives as well. So it is a very balanced governance model. We are definitely not sort of uh, a bank-driven initiative. And as I mentioned earlier, the, the kind of the way that we've developed the standards has been um, absolutely collaborative and transparent. And the stuff that we're doing now around conformance and certification, um, the things that I didn't talk about but we're now starting to build out is um, monitoring services as well. So that's a combination of technology and, and uh, sort of uh, services and processes around monitoring things like performance and availability, providing dispute management services. All of these things are done in a very open and transparent manner. Um, and, you know, we have got a, in, in the UK, we're very fortunate, I think, to have a very uh, vibrant sort of fintech community. Um, we are very transparent with pretty much everything we do. And I think that, that transparency combined with the, that, that governance model me, and the fact that we are all independent, I think, you know, we're, we're, we're getting to the right place. Well, on behalf of a major bank, I would like to say, say that, that though open I, API is a, very important for all major banks, and we're all looking forward uh, to be able uh, to work in this direction in Russia and in the Financial uh, uh, Technologies Association, we'll all do that. But there's another tier here, uh, but is opening data mandatory? You see, uh, in uh, Europe, it's a mandatory requirement. All banks must open data to anyone who meets the requirements of accreditation and requirements to the uh, request for data. In the United States, they went into another direction. American banks have the right to decide who they would want to open data to. And they also only regulate the technology and the standards that allow to exchange that data. And honestly, the question in Russia is whether we have want to have this mandatory disclosure or each financial institution, depending on the preparedness of the data, on the level of confidentiality of the data, and whether it's classified data. There's quite a lot of... Uh, uh, data related to state uh, defense, for instance, in major banks. So whether we, so, the question is whether we want to disclose all the data. So I think that this discussion must take place in the public field. Well, PSD2 is important. Data privacy is also very important. And technological standards are important. We haven't answered this question yes, yet. So Victoria wanted to partially answer that question. It's important to have a, an open public debate about data. So the, the open banking journey in Australia started much broader than banking. So in 2014, there was a discussion uh, that looked at um, competition and efficiency in financial services. And that led to a whole of economy review about data availability and use in 2016. And I really recommend everyone to go and read that report because it talks about the lost opportunity of data availability. And it says that the protections, the frameworks that we had in place before this wide scale digitization are inappropriate. And, and because of that, it recommends two things. It says that we need to give greater access to data because that will lead to greater choice and competition and that we also need new, uh, new laws and new rights for people to get access to that data. So just to echo what Gavin was saying, they've really put the customer, the consumer, at the center of a data economy. And they call out the fact that inequitable access to data leads to uh, monopolies, inequitable use of data. And, and so I think it's really important in Australia that was a very public debate. You had people providing submissions representing consumers, representing retailers, representing health authorities, energy, and, and our open banking journey. Open banking is the first cab off the rank. It's just the first sector that will have to give up access to its data. 
So the next sector is energy, the one after that is telecommunications. And, and I really can't recommend that report enough to say that the, the government found that by not giving access to data, it was a lost opportunity for efficiency and economic growth for Australia. The other thing I'd like to add just quickly is the US Treasury four weeks ago introduced the FinTech report encouraging the US to reverse out of their bilateral agreement between banks and FinTechs because it was just getting too complicated. Under Regulation E, which requires the large US banks to regulate the technology companies that connect to them, we ended up in a position where the banks were having to regulate the data access to their competitors. It was really, really strange. So the US is now um, actively working uh, with the uh, fintech and banking community. Um, I'm, I'm personally involved in those negotiations and they're trying to urgently unwind the bilateral spaghetti that they have cooked up um, to try to create an open framework. Thanks a lot. Victoria, a very important as you've, you've spoken about a very important aspect. We can talk about data being not only an open API as a tool of uh, disclosing that data is not only necessary to create a new customer experience, but it is necessary for digitalization of uh, economy. And Australian experience is notable here. We'll come back to it because really colleagues uh, see the stages of development in a different manner. Uh, they set more global objectives. I was really very much su surprised. Well, I was not surprised by the fact that it was initiated by the banking system uh, as first stage one, but uh, the second area where open API being energy sector, that is a surprise for me. I expected something closer to financial area, maybe insurance. We'll come back to that later. And now I would like to ask a question to Nikolai. Nikolai, you've been working with major banks in Russia and abroad, and I would like to listen to your opinion about how you see the implementation of uh, open banking in general and how that can affect major market players, what we can expect, what we can be apprehensive of, and uh, I would like to listen to your concept of banking as service. What is the future of that concept? And actually, during one of the discussions, panel discussions today, we discussed small and big fintechs, giants and startups. Do you really believe and will the open banking philosophy facilitate the development of individual fintech industry you can expect in midterm that even if some uh, startup does something new, uh, then the giant startup, the giant fintech will really. Uh, so to start by being a little provocative in the spirit of Alieg Tinkoff, uh, and I know you're going to end by saying what you should do as an organization and what the central bank should do. So I have an observation to make, which sounds a little unfriendly. But last week, I was at a JP Morgan conference also about tech, tech leaders. And at the fintech panel, every single person was from a fintech company. And today, I sat in both plenary sessions, which was super interesting. But you had 12 speakers, and not one of them was from a fintech company. So I would make the observation that if you listen to Gavin and Chris, the word that both of them kept using was collaborative. And I think the one thing you need to change at the conference and in Russia is you need to collaborate. You need to have the fintech guys actually sitting instead of us. Uh, so that's the first comment I'd make. Uh, in terms of answering your question, I think, as you've just heard, even in the UK, which is quite advanced, this is all still quite new. And I think what you're seeing from the big banks, so I'll answer the big banks and the fintechs, I think what you're seeing from the big banks is a recognition that no one's quite sure how this is all going to develop. 
Uh, and so you're seeing a lot of collaborative actions. And I think if you pick the most extreme example, and sadly there's the other end, I think it would be JP Morgan, right? So JP Morgan has already invested in a hundred fintech companies. Uh, they are, their IT budget, by the way, is $10 billion every year. Uh, they recognize that they're not quite sure how everything's going to develop, so they have a very open and collaborative model. Uh, for example, in peer-to-peer uh, uh, -peer immediate payments, so if you're in a restaurant and you want to pay the bill collaboratively, JP Morgan had a company called QuickPay, and then they realized that it wasn't good enough, and there was a better company out there called Zelle, and so they folded QuickPay into Zelle, right? So this is JP Morgan saying, Here's an area we think we cracked, and then they're saying, actually, no, there's a fintech out there that's done it even better. What, what I think is even more interesting is six banks use the platform, right? So the collaboration in, in Europe is very sophisticated. It's bank to tech fintech, it's bank to big tech, and it's bank to bank, right? So going back to JP Morgan as well, as everyone probably knows, they have a close alliance with Amazon, and so they are now trying to do co-branded cards with Amazon Prime. That's 100 million customers in an instant. And so that's what I, see, I think you're seeing from the big banks in Europe and in the US, a real willingness to co collaborate, to try. And I picked JP Morgan as an example, but BBVA in Spain has been very active. SCB in Sweden was the first investor in a fantastic fintech out of Stockholm called Tink which is really actually at the forefront of exactly what we're talking about. They are using uh, PSD2 extremely successfully and have now been adopted by a lot of the big banks in Europe. And then I think on the fintech side, yes, it's tough uh, because these banks, at least in Europe, are really uh, competing. Uh, but uh, I think there are, there's real opportunity, but I think you've got to be very, very clear in my mind on four questions. Uh, so I think if you're a fintech looking at the space, you've got to have a very clear strategy on your IT platform. And again, the word you keep hearing, even if you don't use an existing system and you build the whole stack by yourself, I think it's got to be flexible enough so that maybe for uh, you know, uh, onboarding customers, you actually use someone else. So everyone's heard of Revolut. They don't use their own system for onboarding. They use another company. So the fintechs themselves are also being very flexible. So I think the first is that. I think a very difficult question is making a decision whether you go B2B or B2C, and I can come back to that. I think the third is geography. Unfortunately for Russian fintech today, the world is a little bit complicated politically, but hopefully one day we'll get beyond that. But I think that's a very interesting question, which again, if you look at the European fintech space, there are a huge amount of models developing the way people are accessing different geographies, even within Europe. And then I think the hardest question is funding and capital. You know, as a fintech, who do you take capital from? When do you take capital? And I think, uh, but if you crack these four, I think there's huge opportunity because I certainly believe that banks have to open up. There is no way, and it's not just about what we're talking about, whether it's on the collection side, whether what's happened on payments or FX, I think the fintechs are encroaching on banking and that will continue. Of course, the, uh, the Russian uh, economy has always had uh, terrific strengths in uh, mathematics, in statistics, in data science. Uh, very, very easy for uh, the Russian economy to be a significant player in the open banking domain. When you learn to really model algorithms against customer behavior, you can be uh, extremely successful in this sphere. And by the way, if I could just make a somewhat uh, shameful recommendation. So if you look at the whole European space, and you know we're talking about open banking, but also banking as a service, there's a Russian company, I don't want to embarrass the founder because he's sitting here, but if you go to the stand called Balance Platform, you will see that already in Russia, you have a fully functioning lending as a service model. And actually, I'm almost certain that in terms of breadth across an entire function, I'm not sure there's an equivalent in Europe. Thank you very much.
As uh, Nikolai has mentioned, at our FinTech uh, panel, we mainly had the representatives from major banks. Olga, I'd like to ask you the following question. How do you envision you representing one of the leading banking groups, the implementation of uh, uh, open banking concepts uh, based on the international experience? Uh, do you believe in banking as a service development, the development of this concept, and uh, you are undergoing a serious digital, digital transformation. So is uh, VTB ready to offer um, uh, services to external parties? Will we grow in independent fintech here in Russia? What do you think about that? As uh, we have discussed it today with our early panels, fintechs are um, around us. We are buying services from them. So how independent fintech will remain after we uh, implement certain things? But uh, some um, people are moving towards in-house, in-house developments. So we are reducing the numbers of uh, uh, industries. We do not get new versions of the software. We are doing it uh, ourselves. And this is an interesting trend, but uh, we should be moving towards uh, open interfaces, API standards, technological standards that are uh, helping us to interact within an ecosystem and to go beyond the banking uh, sector, as uh, Victoria rightly mentioned, uh, to disseminate the requirements of PSD and also uh, information disclosure to other um, uh, related or not related spheres. I think it's an evident step that should be taken uh, by regulators, including Russian regulators. We have to do that as soon as possible. We have to specify uh, the direction for us. And of course, we should use uh, the experience of our European and American colleagues. Uh, the world is uh, very huge and we'll have to come up with it. And um, some experiments have been made in other countries and we have uh, uh, to do the same here, and we understand that it has to be done. And uh, getting back to fintech partners, over the last three years, uh, we um, have had uh, the time when banks were afraid that um, the fintech will acquire all the banking space and will have no banks. Uh, but now we are peacefully interacting and we are making interesting business proposals to each other. But as a result, based on this discussion, we've created uh, an environment of uh, constant interaction, non-stop communication between uh, banks and fintech companies. Mainly here we are having young companies, uh, uh, but there are some developments emerging that appeared um, for the first time 25 years ago, but at that time it was not possible to monetize that. But now it seems uh, like an interesting development and uh, you are glad uh, that um, these technologies are uh, already emerging and you have seen them before and uh, as accelerates um, uh, corporate accelerator, uh, we selected 12 projects to be implemented. We selected that out of 95 projects. We have excellent teams, uh, young teams um, that consist of postgraduate students of graduates and the guidance of professors. But the question is, how will we integrate these uh, solutions how to make that uh, in practice and to uh, get the profit from it. And uh, GP, GP Morgan and uh, Bank of America and Citibank are speaking about the same. And sometimes it is easier to buy a solution and then to build it in, in the algorithm, and not to start from scratch. So now we are undergoing uh, the phase when we understand that we need it, 
now we have um, the period of interaction, of uh, collaboration, uh, using these ideas of uh, fintech. So we are either buying them or um, uh, creating themselves and uh, ourselves. We do understand that uh, we have to implement this transformation. We as uh, large institutions, we are trying uh, to make a, s a certain set of uh, things because we have to meet the demand and the needs of our retail uh, customers primarily. And um, it's all about mainly about uh, retail business. And we are trying to improve uh, our back office and to improve our legacy. But the digital uh, transformation, uh, we can see it in this uh, um, first uh, Tier. And um, it's not very um, uh, rapid, uh, and we do not see all the aspects. And new tasks are being set in data science. We are dealing with uh, those uh, issues together with the Department of uh, Risk and also with our colleagues uh, that are selecting best offers for clients. And we see that uh, primarily these are retail clients. There are a lot of them, and we can implement new uh, programs, new models, and to forecast the flows and the corporate uh, business. Uh, is lagging behind a little bit because among fintech, there are few teams that know what they should do in corporate business. I'm not talking about SMEs because it is more about retail models, but large businesses and medium-sized businesses, they do not have any offers, any proposals on the, on the part of developers and uh, fintechs that we are working with. So I think that the new uh, major wave in digital uh, transformation uh, will be in uh, corporate businesses, the models, and the products that we will be offering uh, our clients to differentiate um, it from ourselves that we used to be uh, 20 years ago. And it would be great to do that in a mobile application. And uh, just summing up, uh, the role of uh, the regulator is very important. We have to have a smart regulator that will be prompting us for certain actions, like the central bank and FinTech tech association and uh, um, they help us understand uh, the changes and that will help us uh, to find the right solution and it will be uh, right to find it not only in the financial sector but also in other spheres as well. Uh, the smart thing, just uh, summing up what Olga said, in digital economy any borders, um, there are limitations for progress. Uh, it can be in ge geographical and other types of borders. And uh, we need to create uh, universal uh, standards without borders. It will help us to develop economy and specific sectors. And now let's get back to Australian experience that um, uh, considered it as a whole, the economy as a whole. And Victoria, I have the following question to you. So you started with the banking sector financial industry, but the initiative will uh, first deal with the four major banks. And the open banking uh, topic, um, you started to discuss that in 2016, when um, it started as well in the UK. And um, next year, you plan to implement the new regime for open banking. So those four banks that will be the first to implement that. What was the reaction on the part of uh, market um, participants and uh, um, how were you able to find the compromise? And uh, you are the head of the strategic um, you, you are the chief strategy officer of Australia, Australian Payment Network. So how do you see that in the um, area of making payments? You could probably tell by my face when you said what was their reaction. That, um, of course, the major banks didn't like it initially. So the, the work that I lead at the Australian Payments Council, we started talking about APIs in 2015, so we published the Australian Payments Plan and it spoke about the need for 
access to the payment systems and access to data. And, and the banks didn't do it. I mean, find, find me a country anywhere where the banks openly walk into open competition. Um, so they didn't, they didn't welcome it, and so we've had a, a law change. We've got the consumer data right, we've got new legislative powers for the Competition Commission, and we've got a new data standards body that is um, creating APIs and standards for data access based on the work they've done in the UK. And, and the four major banks have to have implemented that within one year. And the aggressive timetable has come because the regulator has said, one, we're only doing read access to data in Australia. And also, they've already done it in the UK. So if Chris has been over to Australia, there's a lot of good learning that is being re reused in, in Australia. But I think many of the banks are already having a mind shift about it. So I think also Chris and Gavin spoke about the fact that some of the major banks in the UK are already looking at the utility that they get from access to other banks' data. So a couple of the banks in Australia have been under really heavy scrutiny from a royal commission into banking. And one of the things they're saying about access to data is that it will make it easier for the big banks to make loan decisions because they'll have better information about someone's financial health. You know, at the moment, I'm sure we're all fantastic citizens and no one lies about their income, but believe it or not, there are people out there that do lie about their income. So it's very hard for the banks to make an informed decision about who to loan to. And so when, when a bank can say to you, oh, sure, Tatiana, I'll give you that loan, but you give me access to all of these accounts that I know you have. So I, the, the point of that is that if, if the major banks get this right, it improves their business, it improves their financial health of their customers. And that was really the regulatory push. It was putting customers first. And, and maybe the banks didn't like it in the first instance, but you know, they're, they're successful businesses. They're, they're responding to it and they're building new business models. And the, I think because we're on this trajectory of much wider data availability, I want my bank to have access to how much I'm paying for my electricity and my insurance and my telco because my bank's a regulated authority. I'd probably trust them to say to me, you know what, Victoria, you're paying too much here. And I, I think because of the wider access to data that the major banks are probably less reticent than they were in the beginning. Uh, thank you very much. And now I'd like to turn to our Russian companies. Uh, Andre, I have a question to you. Uh, Kiwi Group quite recently has opened their own um, payments um, system for fintech uh, project implementation and launch. And uh, you've given a possibility to our Evolute to propose uh, their uh, services to Russian customers. Could you please tell us about this experience, how Open API accelerated this process and what was the role of it? Uh, unfortunately, microphone. Well, actually, we are in the process of integration right now. And trying to solve the problems that uh, we faced, we uh, actually created a unique solution for the Russian market, which allows not only Revolut, but other companies that might be interested to get access to the payment infrastructure because we have a banking license and we have the right to operate in this market, uh, which uh, by default fintech companies uh, do not have. And uh, these, uh, this uh, was not only about the technical interaction in API, but a lot of other issues, including uh, something that the participants of the discussion mentioned, it's personal data and compliance and the um, legal issues and because uh, the regulator has not launched open banking in Russia yet, they're still discussing it. We had to uh, negotiate those issues as two companies, but naturally within the uh, Russian regulatory framework. And I would like to note that 
If there is a wish on behalf of the financial institution, certainly you can open API and provide access to fintechs, but that doesn't happen by itself. In continuation of the discussion that we had, I would like to say that major banks, especially in the market where the consolidation of banking business is high, this is not very profitable for the banks just because they don't have the technical capability and they are not willing to move in this direction. I believe that the role of the regulator is very important here. It's critical here. And without a reasonable pressure from the regulator, I think tech companies are unlikely to get access to the infrastructure of major banks, at least. The story with Revolut is a case is case study for us because Tatiana said that ton, tens of billions of dollars are being invested in fintechs and we're sure that the world will have some other successful tech uh, cases that will uh, really uh, uh, breakthroughs and certainly these companies will would like to upscale geographically and as different from social networks and internet companies each new geography in uh, financial uh, industry it's very difficult because uh, there is uh, certain legal frameworks there are regulations the certification process licensing process and we don't want to attack this niche by ourselves we want to become a player that will make it possible for these companies from different markets, from Russian market or from any other market, to launch that business in Russia. And because we have a wide experience and we operate as a fintech company, as a digital company, so apart from standard APIs, we have uh, a lot of other services that are needed for to those who load launch uh, digital financial services. And that's uh, simplified uh, identification channels, uh, the uh, delivery of cards and uh, aggregation of accounts and a lot of other things. And because we've been for a long uh, in the market for a long time, we know how to do it. So the story with Revolut for us is um, kind of a learning case, and we have uh, several other projects in the pipelines uh, which would be using this infrastructure. Thank you, Andre. Well, Kiwi believes in a separate uh, fintech industry. Oleg, you are the head of the holding that works within uh, requiring and payment systems. So. How would uh, the open banking improve a new uh, payment experience by the client? And what do you think about new banking services? Thank you, Tatiana. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Well, it's quite obvious that API and uh, the payment application uh, interface uh, have opened uh, new possibilities. And we have seen that. Uh, every day uh, with our mobile technologies. So I'm going to tell you what's happening with uh, payment systems and acquiring. And I believe that by the end of my presentation, you will understand why I decided to show this very picture. Maybe it will make you smile. Our future, I will start from the political uh, standpoint, from the central bank position, is uh, the bank transfers, but still we have micro businesses, we have uh, that is not covered by acquiring and small businesses and other businesses. And we are moving towards this sector quite actively. But nevertheless, that will take a lot of time, uh, 20 to 30 percent of acquiring um, uh, shares of our banks are pro profits uh, that lose money. So uh, API allows to uh, resolve this problem, providing a most uh, efficient uh, 
of solution that's uh, a payment service providing. This is a technological model that uh, works with merchants, that's uh, search, that's uh, connecting to the host, training, and connecting to the service. So everything that frees the bank from this routine and unnecessary work. This is processing. The second part, it's certainly with a full package of certifications, RPA, PSS, and so on. And it's a service platform. I would call it a technological outsourcing. This is not a service. This is not the replacement of network terminals. This is not replacing hard copies. These are three technological aspects which make this network efficient. It's monitoring, professional monitoring. Each machine, each uh, ATM, which provides and does provide for the, throughout the country as a lave 24 by 7. And this is a DMS uh, which doesn't just uh, download some soft. This is a heavy product that manages, uh, controls uh, distributed networks. That's the key project, the bank, bank, bank keys uh, project, uh, principle, and that changes uh, the efficiency of uh, banking network management. That's how it looks from the uh, standpoint of application. That grows uh, the uh, number of uh, merchants that allows uh, to bring in new regions that come automatically. That is uh, a service model or a service possibility. And that is, uh, for instance, small companies that are not very into I apologize, Oleg. Uh, you know, this is a very specific subject. It's all about open interfaces. So we should not um, deviate into acquiring. Uh, that is not an easy subject for bankers. So if we're talking about open interfaces, do they allow to develop payment services in a new fashion? Yes. None of the items that I mentioned is impossible without open banking, neither monitoring, because uh, nor the interfaces related with bank, not downloading data, not providing uh, keys is possible without uh, open banking. Thank you very much. Colleagues, I would like to thank all the participants of our discussion. I would like to thank you. I hope that you found it interesting uh, to listen to international experience and maybe to use some of uh, what has been discussed in your own companies. Thanks, everyone, and I hope that our discussion will continue on the fintech platform.